Okay, folks, we're up and running. Uh, there's quite a few of you joining at this lunchtime session today. Hello, I'm Hazel Chu. I'm your Lord Mayor of Dublin City. I'm joined today by the Chief Executive Owen Keegan. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping. So we're doing these sessions. Like It, it was very obvious by, uh, I think, uh, announcement there that we won't be opening back up for a while and this house at the mansion house is normally used for events and it's used for outreach so it's very conscious that we won't be able to engage with the community as well and I in role wouldn't be able to go out as well to people to to chat to people to engage so this is a way that we talk of here in the office to chat to people to to see what your concerns are but also to have a ch show you what we're doing in the council and talk to you about what's happening in the council because I've had quite a few people who tell me well they don't really know how the council works they don't really know who's behind it so we figured this is a good way to show you some of the people behind it talk about the issues of the city talk about what we're doing and uh, what better way to kick it off than have the chief executive the man himself here uh, today uh, welcome Owen thank you all right well, we're going to kick off with you in one minute. We just want to tell all the guests joining us that there will be Q&As open. You can see in the bottom of your screen, the Q&A box. Uh, put your questions into that and we will try to answer it. If we can't get to it, don't, we will um, send us an email at lordmayor at dublincity.ie and we'll get to it then. So, but we will try to answer as many as possible. There is quite a number of people uh, on right now. There's 138 and timing. So uh, if we can't get to everyone, don't worry, we will come back to you. And also this session is being recorded. So the guests that are on screen, myself and uh, Owen Keegan will be recorded with, with the conversation. No one else appears on screen. So, so uh, your, your um, faces, nothing will be recorded there, just so everyone knows. Okay, um, we are going to go uh, live now with Owen. Owen, welcome to our first of what I call Chew and Chats. So I hope you like the title. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to kind of kick off with um, a bit about you. I know a lot of people see you in the me media, see you kind of uh, as the chief of the council. Like, I guess a bit about you yourself and what that role is and uh, how you got there. Okay, uh, myself, uh, I was appointed chief executive in 2000, October 2013. Um, appointments to chief executive position in local authority are open by open competition conducted by the public appointment service. Prior to that, I'd been chief executive of Dunleer at Down County Council. And prior to that, I'd been an assistant chief executive and director of traffic in the city council. And then uh, before that, I have worked in what was then the Department of the Environment for about 15, 20 years. I worked in the Department of Finance. I worked for about eight years in Davy Stockbrokers. And I had a short period, less than a year as a research fellow in the SRI. Okay, so quite a very career, and you've been in the City Council now for how long? Uh, well, <clears throat> this is my eighth year now. Uh, my seven years was up, I think, last October, so I'm in, in my eighth year. And then there would have been about 12 years before that, you know, immediately before I was Chief Executive and Leader at Town County Council. Okay, so it, it, quite a bit of time at this stage. And I guess what we've noticed this year, and especially through the correspondence in this office, is it's a really difficult, it, it's beyond difficult, it's a really tiring, exhausting, challenging, and awful time for everyone this year with COVID. How have you found um, from managing your teams and how the City Council has been running? What, what has been going well? What, what are areas Excuse me, apologies. Uh, what are areas that you think have, have, have done well? What do you think that there are gaps on? Well, look, I, I, uh, first of all, I think everybody is finding it uh, very difficult uh, in, in a COVID environment. But I think uh, my own view is I'm very satisfied and, and very pleased with the way City Council staff have responded. I mean, the City Council isn't the quickest kind of moving organisation. So in a short period of time, you know, we, we had to change the whole way of working. And that meant that about 90% of our office space staff had to be set up to work from home. And we had to, you know, services that were traditionally delivered at counters, we had to ensure that those services could be delivered, you know, online, uh, over the phone, whatever. 
Um, in fairness to most of our outdoor staff, um, after an initial week or two, they were more or less all back in work. So, you know, we took a view that a lot of our outdoor services, whether it's providing water, or wastewater services as an agent of Irish water, street cleansing, even the parks, that it was really important that we maintain those services. So all our outdoor staff, um, uh, you know, more or less were, were back working. But that involved an awful lot of changes to comply with the COVID protocols. It meant changing staggering start times and finish times, denying people access to canteens, making people work in pods. So um, a lot of changes in the way the outdoor staff uh, were required to work. It demanded a lot of flexibility. And I have to say, our staff uh, were magnificent and there, was, there were no issues. They just cooperated and have continued to cooperate fully. I'd also say that um, in relation to our emergency services, COVID posed unique challenges for the fire brigade, particularly at the early stages when we wouldn't have, I suppose, have the full, I suppose, awareness of the importance of full PPE. Um, so having to respond to a lot of ambulance calls where there was a, a high probability the individual had COVID, uh, that posed serious challenges for us. But again, I think our fire brigade staff uh, responded very, very well. So overall, I mean, we've had a few hundred cases and we've had, you know, up to about 10% of our staff over the last year have been out, you know, either because they got COVID themselves or more generally because they were related to people there or they were out on sort of a protective kind of quarantine. But notwithstanding that, we have maintained, I think, the vast majority of our services. And, and I'm very happy. And I think it reflects very well on the council staff that they've been able to do that. This is the thing I, I, I found that it was that there, there were a lot of people that just went to work and continued on with the city, like everyone from maintenance to, to parks. And I, I guess like there are special shout outs across the board that, that staff needs to be acknowledged and show how, how great a, a job they did. But there were also, I, I guess, at the end of the day, some gaps as well that we, we can do better. What are the things that you see going out of COVID that we should do better? This is very informal, by the way. Yeah. It's not committing you to anything. So. No, I, well, look, I, I, I probably should have mentioned one of the areas that I was particularly pleased with was our response in terms of maintaining homeless services because we did have to maintain counter services for homeless. But also, uh, we had to respond in a very short period of time and you know, implement COVID protocols in all our emergency accommodation while working with, with our, our, um, the uh, voluntary agencies who run these. And that meant closing a whole lot of uh, hostels, which couldn't be made kind of fit for a purpose in a, in a COVID environment. And it made, made, meant accessing a whole lot of other accommodation, mainly hotels. But the net effect is that we were able to, you know, provide sort of COVID-proof accommodation for our homeless population in a very short time. And, you know, I would have expected at the start of COVID that our homeless population would have been particularly vulnerable and that we'd be faced with a very high incidence of COVID among homeless persons. The number of um, COVID cases has been very, very low. And I think that that's a great reflection on the work of the, the homeless executive uh, uh, and indeed the other agencies and the HSC that work very closely with us. And of course, the, the various voluntary groups. So I, I think that was a, a very good example of cooperative effort uh, that achieved a very positive outcome. Yes, of course, there are gaps. Um, you know, there are services that aren't being provided. And I, I suspect there are people who, you know, aren't as computer literate and are finding it difficult. And maybe because they can't deal with us as they would traditionally do, they're just not bothering to deal with us. So, uh, you know, I, 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 it would be very, a bit premature to declare victory and say everything is, is, is fine. I think I, I'm becoming aware, you know, every week you, you realize, oh gosh, we'd stopped doing that for some reason and trying to, you know, so there have been breakdowns in service, and I suspect there's a group of people who find it more difficult to access our services. But overall, I'm very happy with the way the City Council has responded. Yeah, and, and you mentioned homeless and, um, services there. Like we, my, myself and Brendan, Kenny and Mary Flynn and the other councillors, a councillor from each group have been quite close in, in the homeless task force that we, we did through this office. And one of the things we found out is there are gaps. So, and we are very happy to pull up our hand to, that, to say there are many gaps. Otherwise there wouldn't be homeless cases. But what we're trying to do is work towards those gaps. And, and one of the things I found is that the DRHE 
is very willing. Now, there's been a portrayal to, to, to say they're not, but I also have noticed that any cases that people have put before them, they, they uh, do deal with them. And also, we, we saw a couple of weeks ago where there were tents being cleared in the city, and uh, rightly so, there was outrage on, on the issue. But then when we went and conveyed what had actually happened in so far, those people within the tents had, had been secured accommodation and moved on. On, uh, and we supported them with outreach to move. I, I think there, there's a distinct disconnect in how we communicate in the city. Oh, and do you do you think we can do it better? Because I think this is the thing. A lot of people see the council as this building with, with uh, these people working on, on Wood Key and that services are done sometimes, but that they don't really know how to connect in or they don't really know how to hear apart from when you, they see you in media or, or somewhere. What do you think uh, in terms of how we work better with people? Look, you know, you, you, you can take it for granted. We can always communicate better. Like that, that's just, you know, that's can't dispute that at all. Having said that, I think, you know, one of the, the least of, less attractive features of Irish society that is a there's an extraordinary enthusiasm for bad news stories so you know one person ends up with you know has his tent removed who for some reason wasn't able to access so yeah that becomes a story like all the cases that are handled well we get you don't get any credit for but if something goes wrong or some person who's refused homeless accommodation on grounds that you know on reflection the person should have been given homeless accommodation so and there's an enormous enthusiasm to highlight those cases. Now, look, it's entirely appropriate that people would draw attention to, you know, failures in service provision. But, you know, you sometimes get the impression that that creates a very, you know, people are really enthused and the media is like undermining the service or giving the impression that that's typical. I think in general, it's, the homeless service is a very, very good service. There's huge improvements have been made over the last few years. But... You know, it's constantly being, you know, uh, criticised in the media. And there are people out there who seem to make a living drawing attention to the odd cases where the service level isn't at the standard it should be. But overwhelmingly, I think it's providing a very good service. Uh yeah, I, I think it's a matter of working together, to be honest. Like you you have been a very open on on saying, listen, I'll come have a chat with you and, and have a chat with, with people who have questions. And I think this is the, the part we're missing in, in a lot of cases because people are highlighting issues and sometimes rightly so highlighting issues, but unless an answer is given or quickly or immediately, it becomes then something that 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 kind of spirals. And from what I learned from working with yourselves, that you're very open to to talking about stuff, but you, you, it just happens to be the case that we don't always seem to be able to give the answer straight away. So maybe it's something that we we, we try to, to better in that regards. So yeah, I think so. And I think the case of tents, I mean, I, I, I would be personally have a very strong view that, you know, you have no legal right to, a, to pitch a tent on public property. You know, it's, it's not good for you. And there's all kinds of adverse impacts for neighbors, et cetera. Now, I can fully understand if, if there's no emergency accommodation, but in a situation where there is plenty of emergency accommodation, there's a choice of emergency accommodation available, and you're offered emergency accommodation, I think it's not unreasonable there'd be an expectation that you would take that, avail of that. Um, yeah, I, I think most there's... people, I think, accept that. But, you know, sometimes people think, oh, we're picking on people in tents, and they don't realise that we have offered all these people what we believe, in many cases, a choice of emergency. And it's not just for one night, it's you know, a longer term stay. And that is the entry into accessing services, which is the key to getting these people into permanent accommodation. So I don't have any issue with our policy on, on tents. Yes, we probably needed to explain because people rushed to judgment and assume, you know, we were just evicting people without any regard to their well-being. And that was not the case. I, well, I think part of it is also, like myself, Brendan, and Mary, and uh, as I said, the other councillors, there's been quite a few involved, Anthony Flynn, uh, Di Doolan, uh, John Horner. Like, there's a lot of people who are trying to make sure that people just work together. And there are things like, in, in terms of just even the emergency services, we need more wraparound service. We have a very good chair of the housing SPC, Alison Gilliland, who, who, who identified that key, key workers were essential when we try to to support homelessness but ultimately housing so we need to build more housing and this is why there, there, there was conversations yesterday on, on housing symposium and how we're building so where do you see 
Dublin in the future when it comes to housing and, and public housing? And where, where do you see the landscape? So on, on how we plan stuff, so, because the city the development plan is now on the way and we're, we're uh, asked for consultation uh, from everyone. Like where, where do you see kind of Dublin looking in one year or to five years down the road? Well, I, I absolutely agree with you. The, the provision of housing of all types is uh, a, a huge priority and a huge challenge for the city. And it's been compounded by the fact now, just when it looked as if housing supply might have been reaching the kind of levels that we need, the housing industry now has been closed down for a substantial period of the last year. Now, again, it's closed down. So, you know, when, when things open up, I, I mean, I'm not really looking forward because I think there's, you know, we're, there'll be a totally inadequate supply. Um, there, there are significant challenges. I mean, the, the, the base of public policy or housing provision policy in the city generally is to, uh, you know, insist on much higher density. But the reality is that high density is not particularly popular with existing residents. And that comes up again and again. So there's this constant, I mean, everybody agrees a kind of a, a principle level that we need to have much higher density. You know, we can't have, you know, extend, you know, the tr traditional kind of suburban estates. That pattern isn't appropriate. It, it represents an inefficient use of land. And it doesn't respond adequately to the fact that household sizes are much smaller. At the same time, you know, the, the, the existing settled population, uh, you know, are not particularly enthusiastic about higher density developments. And I think there's also an issue that an awful lot of potential uh, purchasers uh, aren't really enamored about living in apartments, mainly because of the failures by that sector to deliver a quality product. And, you know, you know it's, it's, what happens here is, you know, special purpose companies are set up, they build a product, they sell it, and then they, they liquidate and they're gone. So we've been held, left holding the can for a number of these developments. And there's been a long-term, I think, reaction to that. People saying, look, it's, you know, given building standards and the standards that apply or are historically applied here, people are just, I think, wary. So that's another uh, factor. We have a particular challenge then in terms of, of, of uh, social housing, you know, so, it's, it's been slow, we're, we're, our program is up and running, but it's been, it has been, look, it's been too slow to get it up and running. And the numbers on the housing list are, you know, are very high. Then there's a group of people who don't really qualify for social housing supports, but clearly at current housing uh, price levels cannot uh, reasonably be expected to house themselves. So that's another huge challenge. So there, there are major challenges in uh, addressing uh, housing need and then I, I think this is the problem we always say housing housing and it, we think it's a one size fit all but it, it never is and this is why every site needs a good tenure mix of, of public and, and affordable so and cost rental and I, I'm hoping that in future that's what we're going to be looking at and like I know from again talking to Brendan yourself there is an eagerness of wanting to to move into uh, moving to a space that we will build we well currently everything is a standstill as you said but that there will be building i i see lots of questions coming in so i'm gonna start I, i'm gonna build it into the chat on on how um so like one of the things we talked about kind of dublin in the future one of the issues people have raised here is like what about outdoor space because you you have a lot of people who need the outdoor space more now who have, needs more kids going out to play or uh, if you're individuals just being able to go as, as somewhere for for a break of peace of mind and also in terms of markets and and um outdoor markets and there's a lack of space how do you envisage the next kind of development plan and the, how we zone things and how we keep how we try to facilitate more outdoor facilities and also have market spaces well i think there's been a as a consequence of COVID, a far greater recognition of the importance of public, the public domain, public parks, you know, so, you know, it has really, I think, made the case, I mean, some people were, were always convinced, but I think it's really reinforced the need for proper recreation spaces. And to the extent that, you know, uh, we have, you know, considerable influence over the public domain, I think, I mean, we, we have been building new parks, first time we've done, we've built Weaver Park, we've another park under construction, Bridgeford Street. So, you know, I, I, we see the need to develop more parks, but particularly to develop more of these pocket parks around the city. So I think the, the development plan will give an opportunity to articulate how we can respond to that really important need of providing better quality recreation space. It doesn't have to be vast areas of space, but 
you know, I think we need to provide more spaces. And then there's a question of how these spaces can be properly animated and can they be accessed by sustainable modes of travel? So there's a real challenge there. I think it's something the council is very keen to do. And I think the development plan will, will set new policies to try and give effect to that or guide the implementation of that. Okay. And I, well, this is going back to one of the questioners' points. Like, and when we look at development plan and outdoor play spaces facilities, when then we look at specifics, because that's an overall strategy of, of planning. When we look at specifics, I know at Christmas, we worked with the traders to make sure there was Christmas trading. And I have to thank your team for, for helping and also the Traders Association, because it, it became, it was something that HSE had said to us, we can't do. And then we, we tried to find workarounds and we were able to get some, but it was not enough. And it, But then it was something that we, we just tried to facilitate and, and because we know how hard it is for, for people right now trading. What are your thoughts on markets, outdoor markets, uh, flea markets and light markets like? Well, look, we, we run very successful markets in a lot of our parks, mainly at weekends. Some increasingly, you know, there's a demand to run those during the week. We, we've uh, one on, I think, is it on a Thursday in, in uh, Merrion Square. They've been very, very effective. I mean, I, I can see no reason why we wouldn't expand those Look, we'd be very supportive of flea markets. We, we certainly tried this year to, to get a, a suitable site, but between COVID and one thing or another, that at Christmas, that didn't uh, come off. But I, I think the council would be very, very well disposed, either on our own initiative or working with uh, operators to facilitate those kind of developments. Sorry, mute button there. Um, okay, that's that's good to hear because I think there needs to, like I think there needs to be a different way of working. The, the general feedback on the Q and A's is is that there needs to be a different way of working. And again, I've said this time and time again. I load to say opportunity when we're going through a crisis and when there's so much debt. But there is there is a a way of trying to reset a lot of things and drive forward something better. Um, talking of driving forward something better than like directly elected mayors and also council. I know you and I had this conversation about local government reform, about councillors. <laughs> I see the laugh. <laughs> well, I was gonna ask you anyway, uh, of, of councillors powers being taken away, of how things have progressed in, in the last 15, 20 years on, on, uh, on local government and how we need reform in this space. Where do you see, like if we were to have a directly elected mayor, where do you see this space? And where do you see kind of councillor's role? How do we make it that it's more working in unity rather than, uh, what, what, rather than kind of fights on certain things or trying to push different directions, so? Well, look, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm almost reluctant to, to uh, comment on the issue of, a, say, a directly elected mayor because, uh, you know, you kind of expect chief executives to be, you know, opposed to that. Now, as, as well as that, like, it, it's not for us. It, it, that's a political decision which will be made presumably by national government. And it's a matter for uh, council staff to comply with whatever the, the organization arrangements are put in place. Uh, I, I would say, however, I mean, I think a very convincing case can be made based on the experience in other jurisdictions for having powerful or, you know, a strong uh, executive mayor. Um, I mean, there are arguments against, but they're certainly, I'd acknowledge their arguments for. But it seems to me if you're going to do it, you want to, you should at least give that person real powers, right? Uh, what I would not favor is changing the current system, which has certain advantages and certain disadvantages for some kind of fudge, which is neither one thing nor the other. And I think there's always a danger that, you know, uh, the model that's certainly proposed sees councils retain all their powers. And it's really a directly elected chief executive is what's now being proposed with sharing the current role of the chief executive. Um, whether that's you know, sufficient, I I'm not sure. And then it it's particularly complicated. There's no decision to raise the government. But I, I can't see any merit in having a directly elected or four directly elected mayors for different areas of Dublin. I think that dilutes the whole concept, I think. You know, you need a, a greater Dublin mayor. Um, you know, the headline that's going to come out of this is Owen Keegan gives up his job for directly elected mayor or something along those lines. So, so. I, I don't, I don't, sorry, I didn't get that. <laughs> I said, you know, the headline coming out of that just now is Owen Keegan gives up his job or gives up powers to directly yeah. elected mayor. Sorry, what, what is actually, as I understand, being proposed is under the model that's being proposed. The, the powers of the councillors, which are very, as you know, are very extensive, um, 
are retained. There's no dilution of the council powers. And what has been proposed is that some of the powers of the chief executive will now be exercised by a directly elected mayor. And the chief executive will become, I don't know, a director general or something. Now, you know, um, uh, I leave it to other people to judge the, the merits of that. It, it's a certainly unique, uniquely Irish solution from what I can see. Uh, and I'm not sure it meets uh, the aspirations of people who have who want a strong, powerful elected mayor. You know, so uh, we'll have to wait and see. Yep. Um, I have a uh, few more questions for you here. So I, I, I know we have a little bit of time left. So I just uh, want to delve into, um, let, we, let us go through here. So, uh, Okay, yeah, some, some of them I'm not gonna... <laughs> oh, God, God, God. some of them are quite jokey. Uh, when is the new team being appointed for, for College Green Plaza? Um, my understanding is that we'll be going shortly for a part eight planning approval for the plaza. I'm, I'm not sure what he means by what's meant by the new team. I guess it's it's when is it going to be in place or when is, because there was a consultation and we got the reply, we got the results back. There was a non statutory consultation. Uh, uh, of the options we put out, there was one clear preferred option, which I think is the option City Council would, would favour. So it, the revised proposals have been very well received. So I think the intention now is to shortly initiate a Part 8 planning process to get the necessary statutory approval and then to proceed with implementation. Okay. And um, your uh, design vision for Dublin Metro, how would it be unique? Well, Dublin Metro is a... It's okay. a, it's a it's a government project, um, and you know, uh, I, I, I mean, it is. It does represent a very high capacity form of public transport. Uh, it, it's obviously it's in the government program at the moment. It's being developed, I think, jointly by the NTA and TII. It'll make a huge difference, particularly in terms of access, uh, particularly from the, the the you know the swords alignment, airport alignment. So it will be a huge plus for the city. I suppose the only concern is. You know, it looks as if it, it, it could be a very expensive project. And um, there will always be uncertainty about the capacity to fund expensive projects. But, you know, we'd be very, it'd be very good for the city and very good uh, for the North uh, County area. You know, so I, I, if that project is implemented, I think it would be a, a huge plus. Yeah, and well, I, I guess for, for the um, person asking there, I guess they were looking for what you, you think your vision is, but you, you seem to think it's a good thing. So is there anything straight off that you can think of that you, you would advise doing, not doing right now? So, and this is asking you rather than the chief executive, I presume. Well, look, I, I mean, I, I, in the past, I, I, I might have been lukewarm on the, but I think at some stage, that project has been on the cards for so long. We, we just better off building it. You know, and that's it. I move on to something else. Like sometimes, you know, you, if you keep on arguing with these projects, you know, uh, there's already been one version of that through, you know, the planning process, and we that was been abandoned, and now we have a slightly, you know, uh, a different version. So, you know, I, I think that there can be a loss of credibility if projects remain, you know, uh, unimplemented for a long, long period of time. So I've come to the view of that project that we're uh, we should implement it now. Or, or take it off completely and on, on balance I think I'd be inclined to implement it now. Yeah okay there's a question here from John saying um, by the way I won't say full names from anyone for GDPR processes but uh, or but John was asking how in regards to you touched on that there on on uh, directly electric mayors but let's look at local government uh, and local administration how it, how can it that we make sure that local government operates better so that it's not just a retention of power that there's more that's being done because there's more there's a lot of white papers there's the Barrington report there's the local government strategic management initiatives how do we make sure that going forward we we put people first that it's not just kind of these reports and that we some some a lot of them get actualized but it doesn't translate perhaps into a benefit for 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 people how if it was you back eight years ago what would you do better let's put it this way to make sure that things get done in a better way well i, I think there is a, a real issue about the degree of dependence on state funding you know so we we, we have a high of it and we we would get about you know, 30, 35, 38% were from rates. Um, but we get, you know, 30 or 40% from state grants. So that gives, and the reality is that, you know, whoever pays the piper calls the tune. So 
for a lot of our programs, say, say housing construction, you know, it's funded 100% by the, the state. So that, it seems inevitable to me that, you know, the state central government is going to retain a very high degree of control. So to some extent, we are just, we end up being the executive agency of the state. So, you know, our elected members may have a view, but the guys who are putting up the money have a different view. So that's a, that's a huge conflict. So the, the high dependence on state funding uh, and, you know, it's led to a situation where there's almost micromanagement of local authorities by central government. Well, look, we've had this conversation about local property tax. It's because we don't have enough money there. And all, all of the um, um, uh, rates, commercial rates, uh, will be repaid by government, but there needs to be more funding locally to give autonomy. So well, like, well, I mean, my view is that you, we, can't, we can't really have a strong system of local government unless it has far greater fundraising powers itself. So therefore, it has responsibility as the class to raise funding. Now we have we have some funding uh, raising capacity, and one of which is property tax. Although uniquely in the city council, our members have been unwilling to raise that over ever since it was implemented. We can raise things like housing rents. Again, I, I've never known the city council to raise housing rents in my time, despite me recommending it on numerous occasions. So, um, but you know, people in central government say, well, there's two two powers you have, and you haven't used them. Stop coming to us looking for more money. So it, it is a complicated issue. But I think until local authorities have, you know, responsibility and the financial clout to discharge that responsibility, we are, it's inevitable that we'll be subject to a, a very high degree of state oversight and control. It seems to me that's inevitable. Yeah, and I, I guess when it comes to, uh, it, it's hard, like I've, I've been in council for a short while and realized that a lot of it is restricted to finance and where we get the money from. And you don't want to pull the levers that will, will affect kind of the public's pocket, but at the same time, where do you find the money for community gain, for for uh, for uh, redevelopment of certain areas and putting into community? And this goes back to our ask for, for our central government colleagues. So. <laughs> Like in fairness, though, I mean, like we have a revenue budget of a billion euro. So, you know, we, no, it's in, we have it. We have a, the potential to have a really significant imp impact on loads of local issues with that budget. So there's always an onus on us to make sure that we're, you know, driving the best value for money and giving the best return on that expenditure. So, you know, on the one hand, you can say, well, look, we're, we're, we're chronically underfunded. That's all the government's fault. And, and there may be a, there may be a in that. And the other hand, you can say, well, let's make sure that the money we have, we're using it efficiently and giving the best quality service for uh, you know, the citizens of Dublin. I'm, I'm more inclined to focus on the latter uh, than, than the former. <clears throat> well, tell me about big projects coming ahead, because there's, hopefully there's more big, exciting projects. What, what are you looking forward to seeing in, in the city coming in the next, next uh, year? Well, uh, one project that uh, I'm, I'm quite enthused about is the Dublin District Heating Scheme, which will use the uh, the spare or the waste heat from the waste energy plant uh, to, uh, I suppose, provide the heat source for you know district heating, uh, and that has uh, a very significant potential to contribute to our, our our climate change agenda, and you know that'll be a project of some very significant scale. So. <clears throat> that's been on the, the cars, you know, ever since the waste energy plant was conceived. And, you know, I think circumstances are just aligning now. So it's right to go ahead with that. We have significant grant funding. There's an appetite and enthusiasm for, enthusiasm for it. And I think that's an example of the, how I believe the city council can deliver, you know, uh, major project, infrastructure projects. Another major project uh, that, you know, where we delivered, say, the Dublin Port Tunnel, so we have a history of delivering projects. Increasingly, the tendency has been to take the responsibility for major project delivery and give it to other agencies. But I'm looking forward to the City Council delivering that project. Uh, and making, Why are we kicking off on that one? We hope to go to tender in the second half of this year. Okay. Um, there's, a, you know, a, we have a, a, a huge, another major project is the, the library headquarters and cultural building. I'm very confident that we'd be proceeding with that project. We, we've been awaiting to so, you know, try to get the funding lined up. Uh, we're very hopeful that that will come shortly. That will make a huge contribution, both in terms of you know, the, the, the north inner city, particularly the Parnell Square quarter. Uh, I think that has the potential to be a, a transformative project. I had the, the, the privilege of, of being associated with the, the library building in Dunleary. And that's, you know, 
I, I think does you know libraries can be reimagined as as huge community resources, uh, and, and that's we would be replicating okay. here. So, when you mentioned Pernell Square Quarter, there's a question here, what is going to happen to former Colossia Rura property in Pernell Square? So is that part of, of what you were? Well, we, what we've done is, you know, um, I mean, look, we, we probably took a misstep there where we, uh, <clears throat> at one stage, uh, we, we accepted an offer of um, that this was going to be funded from, you know, uh, private donations. Uh, that didn't work out. It's now become purely a city council project. We've divided in two phases. I'm very confident to go ahead with phase one, which will see the new building and one or two of the Parnell Square buildings uh, redeveloped. <clears throat> and then we follow that up by doing all the other buildings, including Parnell Square, uh, including Close to Work. But if we can get the main project off, I think we'll, it'll be, we'll be able to do the other buildings one by one. So it's not a huge, as big a challenge. So it's not like we have to come up with a full amount of money we can do them. And I could see those being done one after another immediately after we get going on the on the, the major project okay. so i'd be very enthused about that project so like we have about two and a half billion euro or 2.3 billion i think it is in our three-year capital program so there are a lot of projects and a lot of those you know well in, in the in the main it's housing and homeless projects and that's about I was about to say because let's 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 kind of try to separate because we I constantly get the argument of if you're not why are you spending on X and not spending on homeless service there there is a budget there for homeless and housing at the moment and it's quite a significant budget. Sixty five percent of all our capital program is for housing and homeless services. Okay, so it's it's not a case that we are taking away from it. There, no, there, the the yes. money, I mean. People don't understand, like, if you take, I mean, a very kind of one that's in the media at the moment is, is the Whitewater Centre. <clears throat> There'll be very little council money going into that. It'll be primarily funded by, we hope, by Fulcher money and by, uh, we hope, grants from the state in respect of the Swift Water Rescue Facility and, if we're lucky, by sports uh, capital programme funding. So we would be a minority funder of that. Now, if that project doesn't go ahead, we don't get the money from Fulcher or, the go you know, the, the, the other funding stream that collapse that goes we don't get that so that's it so we're actually we would... going to delve more into that because uh i i, I was going to ask you but i was also going to ask our guests in two weeks time uh richard shakespeare the uh, deputy uh um chief executive who is looking after that project and delving into detail i'm sure he'll love that but, but... he's a powerful advocate of that project <laughs> so uh, but, but no tune in to hear him defend it I'm, I'm sure he, he'll love me uh, putting that on now the table. But to your point, we, we are going to be looking for funders. Now, I, I, I'm going to tell the audience now, there, there are going to be significant debate and discussion about this issue, as always is. But I think it, it's good to hear the chief executive explain the funding side. Like You're, you're talking to also a councillor who voted against this. So, so there needs to be scrutiny on these things. But I do want to... Um, I, I guess I want to address the point of the argument from people that say, says, if we don't pull it on this, you're not building more housing. The plan is we need to build more housing as it is and that there will be funding for that. And part of our discussions, definitely with my discussions with the minister, is that it's, it's not, a, not just a money issue when it comes to housing. It's everything else when it comes to procurement, to development, to, to, to t mix, uh, t tenure mix. And that's, just, uh, uh, that's the issues we have to get over. And we have to get over quickly uh, because we do need to build. Well, look, more. I mean, everybody accepts the priority attached to housing and you know we are a housing authority and the bulk of our revenue our current expenditure and our capital expenditure quite rightly is on housing but we also have a broad range of objectives I and mean, we were responsible for the road network we have to invest in that we have to invest in footpaths sustainable travel you know we, we talked earlier about the importance of parks and recreation facilities and sports facilities there's huge pressure to upgrade those we want to invest in our library network and we have a broader economic development and that, that includes promoting and assisting in the promotion of tourism, which is important for the Dublin economy. So I, I make no apology for having a wider focus than purely housing, notwithstanding the fact that housing is and will always be our number one priority. Yeah, I think we have our top priority and then we need to have, and this comes back to ambition and will because there's a lot looking at some of the, the, uh, cons uh, the feedback from the city development plan and consultation process. There is a lot of um, 
ambition there from people. Like there's a lot of suggestions. I've, I've seen people so engaged in what will happen at the city. And that's because right now our city is a bit of a donut. So there, there's a hole in the center that's left behind in terms of not having the, the office workers or, 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 or tours. And it's a good time for us to try to reform how the city center and also the periphery looks like. And in terms of the periphery, the villages and towns that are within the city, we need to support them. And I've seen good support in terms of uh, local enterprise, but I've also seen it in terms of COVID mobility, which leads us to the next big question, which seems to come in a lot of on, on the issue of Strand Road and um, uh, the Strand Road cycleway. So I have a, as with all things Strand Road, there seems to be a good balance of people saying uh, it's great to see it happen. And then there's a, another good balance of people saying on the, the questions of how do we justify it and why are we doing this to, to the area? I guess it, it's good to hear. I think the issue has always been when people heard this, they heard you saying it in media. And this comes back to my communication issue that a lot of times when we have projects, we don't talk about the projects first, we see it on a headline in media. So it's a good time to, I guess, bring your perspective in on what you think the project will be and how, or not will be, how it will look. And I guess to, to address some of the uh, feedback here that we're getting on, on the Q&A, some people love it, some people hate it. What do you think? Well, I obviously love it. Uh, I, I had a role in, in you know proposing it internally here. Uh, there's no doubt, I mean, the delivery of, of a higher quality, good quality site facilities has been objective to the council for a number of years. Progress has been too slow. Uh, and while everybody, you know, as, as in principle is in favour of improved cycling, you know, when we go to implement them, of course, everybody says, well, you can't put it out there. I, you know, I don't want, you know, my car parking gone or I don't want this tree cut down. So it's always been difficult. So COVID undoubtedly gave a huge impetus to providing. And, and I, I make no apology for the fact that we, we've taken full advantage of COVID. And I think the reaction generally across the city has been people say, well, great, we're getting protected cycleways and we're getting them in quickly. And I think Sandy Mount or the Strand Road, you know, was another uh, opportunity to get, you know, a good quality cycle um, facility in. And it very much is mirroring what had been done in Dunleary. And yes, we were taking out a lane of traffic. We had taken a view that, you know, we could afford to take out that lane of traffic. You know, we're not going to get, you know, there's the view around there. Well, can we have, we can have cycle facilities, but there's been absolutely no interference in vehicular traffic. And I just don't think, you know, it's not deliverable. There's going to have to be difficult decisions. You know, some people will both perceive themselves and will actually be inconvenienced. But it's not, I mean, it's not the end of civilization, you know. And um, they may have to, they'll always have vehicular access to their to their houses or their businesses. They may have to do a slight detour. But as a, again, in return for that, you get a very high quality uh, cycling facility. And we have seen, uh, you know, the experience that if you provide protected cycle facilities, people will use them. So there's been a huge uptake of cycling where we put in these facilities. And I think that makes the case where we need to put in a lot more. Uh, Recognising that some people will feel that, well, some people have no intention of using them and they'll be inconvenienced. But I think that's a small price to pay for the very considerable advantages. So there we are. And I guess the, the argument is, and, and this is the thing I haven't, I made no secret of the fact that I support this because I do think, you, you said uh, taking advantage of COVID, but more, for me, it's about keeping people safe. And with COVID mobility, it's providing that safe space that people can still go out and, and try to, 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 to kind of relieve some of the mental stress and physical stress they have, but feel socially distanced. And to have a city where you have those cycle lanes, where you have the wider footpaths is essential. Like I look at the Paris model, I look at the Denmark model, I look at Italy and what they've been doing and across the board, the COVID mobility model is not dissimilar to what's been rolling out abroad. I guess this comes back to an essential issue that I guess it comes to ultimately how we communicate and how we share information. There, there, is, there is a disconnect there, but, it, but I think we're doing it better. Like I've seen it recently where, where Sandy Mount residents received the information on what's happening with Strand Road. And I received a lot of feedback saying that that's great. Again, I received uh, feedback saying that's not great, but there's always a balance to be struck. So I think in relation to this project, it's seeing how that balance is. Now, I do know that the, the um, 
that there was um, an injunction going into court and it might be going back in, it will be going back in in April again. So, so that project right now, as it stands, we're, we're going to, to look into to what the issues are and we're going to continue working on it. So like, is there, I, I, I guess- well, Just be clear, yeah. we will observe the terms of injunction, we have to stop working. So, you know, all those half built, you know, uh, the works, they would just have to stop immediately. So uh, we will be fighting the substantive legal case, hopefully sometime in April. Uh, but like the city council is absolutely committed. We're not going to disappear just because it was, a, this is a temporary setback. I think it was very unfortunate, um, but there we are. Um, we, we'll abide by the terms, but we'll be back in April to make the substantive case again. I hope we win the substantive case in court. Yeah. Uh, but I, I personally think, you know, this might be a setback, but there is a kind of an inevitability about sustainable travel. You know, the notion that there will be unfettered private car travel, you know, those days are over, you know, it's not sustainable. There's a huge enthusiasm to move away from that. You know, people may not like it. They'll have to adjust it. Uh, just on the question of uh, that there's a lot of people going, well, there were alternative plans and why don't you move it into the all side? Those were all assessed by the team. The alternative plan involved taking a whole footpath away, which is completely against the urban design ma manual and going into the uh, wall, the uh, seawall itself ruins a whole uh, a whole section of biodiversity, which we, we can't afford to lose at the moment. So, so like engineers have looked at this to see what is the best way forward. And this is why there's a trial for this process. Now, I like to, I, I said on chairing the consultative form, I completely understand where people are coming from in terms of concerns, but we do ask that you, that people try to connect into us or into the team or into the residents because the last thing we want to do is make this a divisive issue. So we, we don't want to divide communities here. We want people to benefit from this and actually be able to use these facilities across the board in Dublin, especially in, in the community. So Owen, we're gonna be wrapping up in a sec. I guess one, one key thing someone had said, does this mean College Green is a plaza is dead. No, I don't think you said that, but just in case you. Oh, no, the, the, the injunction applies to the Strand Road. Yes, sorry. We yeah. The planning process, which we would be initiating very shortly. Okay. Um, well, any last words before we go, Owen? Uh, no. Um, one thing I would have said if you'd asked me is that the primary role of the local the chief executive is to work with the elected members. Working relationships in this council are very, very good. The, the appearance is given erroneously, I think, that the, the, the executive and the, the political members are always at loggers. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, there's a very high degree of consensus. I think generally we work very well together. We share the same objectives. There might be some difference at the margin, but you know, I, I've always found Dublin City Council, um, there's a tremendous mutual respect between the executive and the elected members, and a huge commitment on behalf of the executive to give effect to the policies that are determined by the elected members. Uh, and this is the thing, it's a balance. Like I've I found in my role working across the board with yourselves in, in, in uh, DCC and the elected members has been the way forward for a lot of things. Um, I, I'm very conscious that a lot of people see you and go, you're the chief executive and, and, and that's it. And that's that the kind of professional persona. So in light of the fact that this is a very informal chat and uh, people want to get to know you, tell me two things. One, what have you been not able to live without during the pandemic? And two, what is your favorite food? Uh, well, I haven't had to go canoeing because all the places I want to go canoeing are more than five kilometers away. So that's the first year in about 40 or 50, 45 years that I haven't been regularly canoeing in the winter. That's, that's the thing I've most missed. Um, I don't have any favorite food. Really? Yeah. <sighs> no favorite food okay so uh, and that wraps us up with the chief executive thank you so much own and anyone who i haven't answered i tried to answer as many of the questions there were quite a few uh, uh if you can email lord mayor at dublincity.ie we will try to get them answered for you that's lord mayor at dublincity.ie next week we uh, have another session at one o'clock and the eventbrite link is up on twitter and facebook and instagram again lovely to chat to you own and lovely to have everyone here this week so thanks again, everyone so see you later bye 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 bye